So welcome everyone. This is our 45th online spin training seminar. And the speaker today is Dr. Ren Cheng um, from uh, UC Riverside. Um, he will talk about manipulating ferry magnets by fields and currents. Um, Dr. Ren Cheng obtained his uh, PhD in condensed matter physics from the University of Texas at Austin in 2014. And then he held a postdoctoral appointment at Carnegie Mellon University. And then in 2018, he joined UC Riverside as a faculty member of uh, electrical computer engineering and physics. His research centers on spintronics and magnetism, and he studies both fundamental physics and innovative applications of a wi wide variety of magnetic materials, especially antiferromagnetic thin films and nanostructures. And he's one of the pioneers of the emerging frontier of antiferromagnetic spintronics. Um, so with this, um, I'll give it over to you, and please uh, go ahead with your talk. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for attending my talk. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the online spintronic seminar for inviting me to present uh, one of the recent works in our group. So this work uh, is then in collaboration with my students, um, Ming Da Guo, so he's a second year uh, graduate student. Um, so this project is part of um, a large MURI grant um, focusing on antiferromagnetic spintronics. So today the topic is about, um, uh, sorry, the host has us start video. Um, so should I press later or start my video? Um, so right now we don't see your video. So if you wanted to, to show, you need to click uh, start video. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah, sorry about this. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about ferry magnets, uh, which is uh, closely related to antiferromagnets. So, oh. Um, can I move my slide? Okay. Okay, so the motivation of this work. Um, so nowadays, uh, <clears throat> you may have heard, heard a lot about antiferromagnetic spintronics in conferences and seminars. So antiferromagnetic spintronics is one of the uh, rapidly growing uh, frontiers with the great promises, uh, such as the ultra-fast spin dynamics, op, um, specifically um, the spin dynamics can be operated in the terahertz region, which enables the ultra-fast uh, device applications. And also there's uh, no stray field because of the absence of macroscopic magnetization in antiferromagnetic materials uh, which directly leads to the immunity to crosstalks um, <clears throat> in, uh, in the magnetic memory designs. However, uh, with the development of uh, this emerging frontier, there is a fundamental challenge um, because of the absence of magnetization. So here I listed it uh, you know, in a comparative manner. Um, between three different magnetic systems. So in ferromagnets, um, it is very easy to detect and control because of the magnetization, but the ferromagnets operate at a, uh, at a much lower uh, frequency. Well, antiferromagnet can be operated at the terahertz region. Uh, its absence of magnetization makes the material very difficult to detect um, and control. So that is the motivation behind the study of ferry magnet, which is somehow intermediate between the two systems. So ferry magnet can be operated uh, with, um, uh, with a terahertz frequency as fast as antiferromagnet, but at the same time, it can be detected and controlled um, uh, very easily as a ferromagnet because the magnetization does not vanish. So the goal of the study uh, is, to, is to study how ferry magnetic systems uh, can function 
as antiferromagnet uh, with a high speed or in the terahertz, with terahertz spin dynamics, but at the same time, how we can detect uh, ferry magnet as a ferromagnet because of its finite magnetization. So basically we want, we want ferry magnetic system uh, to share advantages of both antiferromagnet and ferromagnet. So this study uh, can inform the study of antiferromagnet. That is uh, the motivation. So here's the outline of my talk today. So basically I will be talking about two different aspects of ferry magnet, the static property and the dynamic property. In the static property, I'm going to, uh, into, I'm going to talk about how ferry magnet react statically to a changing magnetic field. And in the second part, I'll be talking about the, uh, the auto oscillations, uh, the, terahertz, the, the high frequency uh, terahertz responses of a ferry magnet driven by a spin transfer torque. So let's now go to the first section. So, um, so this work is, um, uh, is just a proof of concept study. Um, so we consider a rather simplified model um, in which the ferry magnet can be described by two sublattices. So in real ferry magnet, it may involve like uh, many different sublattices and it's rather complicated. But in the simple modeling, we just uh, regard the system as consisting of two sublattices, say S1 and S2, in which the S1 is longer than S2. So they have a spin imbalance, even in the ground state. That's how a ferry magnet differ uh, from an antiferromagnet. So we consider a uh, easy plane ferry magnet uh, with, an easy plane, uh, with an in-plane easy axis. And the in-plane easy axis, it's supposed to be much smaller than the hard axis. So uh, inducing an out-of-plane spin um, rotation that is very hard. So we focus on the in-plane response to an in-plane magnetic field. And this is the energy term of the system. Um, so we consider an in-plane easy axis alone, while well, the hard axis, like I said, is much stronger, so we ignore the out-of-plane uh, spin candy. And the B-field is restricted to in-plane alone. So now we look into the following uh, vectorial uh, quantity, uh, quantities. So we, um, we, look, we look at these, the two uh, unequal sublattices. Uh, the magnetic field, um, the magnetization, and the new vector. So first of all, let's apply the B field along the easy axis direction and sweep the B field strength. And let's see what, what happened. So when we increase the B field, then initially nothing happens until suddenly the two spins flop to a new direction and then gradually polarized by the increasing B field. So this behavior is very similar to our familiar spin flop transition in antiferromagnet. And we can see the process again in terms of the M and the new vector. So increasing B field induces a, an abrupt flop of the system parameters until they are both fully polarized by an extremely large B field. And also we can see the system response to um, a constant B field, but with a um, changing um, orientation. And uh, by the way, so here, the process that I'm considering is cause aesthetic. So the B field changes very, very slowly and the system remains in the, in the ground state. So if we rotate the B field, then it seems that both spins just exactly follows the, um, the rotation of the magnetic field. Um, but we observe that uh, for every 90 degrees, 
the ground state uh, configuration of the two spins changes. And this fe feature can be seen more clearly in terms of M and N, where we see that if we pay close attention to the new vector N, then we see that the new, um, oh, I'm sorry, I think I made a mistake. So I, um, so the, the green, sorry, the orange arrows represent the small, um, the small magnetization, while the purple arrows represent the new vector. So let's see this again. Oh. And I, So let's try to see this again. So you see the, uh, the small magnetization actually evaporates back and forth around the rotating B field. So um, with the rotating B field, the system does not just follow um, the magnetic field, it actually uh, reacts in a rather complicated way. And to see this more clearly, um, we plot four different quantities. Let's use the laser pointer. So here we plot four different quantities uh, in terms of the magnetization as well as the new vector. And the parallel uh, subindex indicates this is the magnetization parallel to the applied B field. And this is the perpendicular component. So of the four components, the parallel, uh, the perpendicular components of the new vector reminds us of the ordinary spin flop transition in antiferro magnets. So um, at a zero degree of the B field, I mean, this is the angle of the B field with respect to the easy axis. So let's see the red curve here. This, is, this clearly shows a spin flop transition, which we just showed in the animation in the previous slide. So initially nothing happens, then suddenly the system flops to a new, or a new configuration until it is fully polarized by an extremely large uh, magnetic field. And if the B field has a finite angle with respect to the easy axis, then the spin flop transition becomes a continuous variation where the face boundaries becomes, uh, you know, uh, disappeared and the curve is continuous. So here, what is interesting is that the spin flop phase is uh, prominent and visible in all four different quantities. And the feature is somehow uh, shows, uh, uh, shows similar structures uh, for zero angles when the B field is exactly parallel to the easy axis then we see a clear face boundary of the spin flop but for any finite angles then the face boundaries becomes blurred and to see this um, spin flop fe uh, feature more clearly now we plot the response of the four different quantities um, uh, from a different perspective now we plot the four quantities as a function of the um, magnetic field orientation um, for different field strength. So the first the two field strength is below the spin flop and the green curve is way above the spin flop when the system is fully polarized. And the red curve is somewhere between, uh, somewhere within the spin flop our, our region. So here, um, again, let's look at the perpendicular component. So below the spin flop, we see two lobes. And above the spin flop, four different lobes are developed. And this structure is, looks similar in both M perp and N perp. So, um, so that indicates that uh, in order to characterize the spin flop transition in ferry magnet, we should look into either M perp or N perp. 
So, but in the following, let's focus on the MPERP component, the magnetization transverse to the applied magnetic field. So what are we gonna see in the following is how the spin flop uh, behavior gradually changes from antiferromagnet to ferry magnet. So this figure plots the perpendicular magnetization to the B field uh, as a continuous function of the uh, magnetic field strength and the magnetic field direction for nine different ratios of the two sublattice spins. So here we fix uh, S1, the first sublattice to be one, and we change the value of the, um, uh, of the other sublattice uh, from 0.1 to 0.9. So what we had just seen in the previous slides are, um, are different cuts in this subfigure with S2 equal to one half of S1. So here in each of the subfigure, the horizontal axis is the B field strength, while the vertical axis is the orientation of the B field. So um, here the spin flop transition is, um, you know, is what within this area, okay? So, um, and, and in each of the subfigure, we see that it is completely symmetric with respect to uh, the angle pi. So we could focus our attention to the angle between zero and the pi, because it is simply symmetric above pi. And so this is the region of the spin flop. And we see that when we increase the, um, the ratio of the two sublattices, then we are going to the antiferromagnet limit. When S2 equals one, this is a purely antiferromagnet. And we see that when we go to the antiferromagnet limit, then the spin flop area becomes more prominent. But when we go to the opposite limit, when the S2 continuously shrink, then the area of the spin flop transition also, also shrinks. And when S2 equal to only 10% of S1, the spin flop area region almost disappeared. So if we further plot an S2 equal to zero, then there will be no spin flop transition at all. So that is uh, pretty much the first part of my talk, the response to a static magnetic, magnetic field, where we have seen that a spin flop transition, which is a fingerprint feature, of antiferromagnet uh, that basically remains in ferry magnet, uh, but with, um, 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 with, a, with a slightly different behavior, okay? So in the next part of my talk, I will be talking about the dynamical response of a fer two sublattice ferry magnet driven by a spin transfer torque. So again, we introduce the dynamical feature of ferry magnet in comparison with an antiferromagnet. Uh, what is the plot here uh, on the illustration of the two dynamical modes of antiferromagnet with an easy axis and a sort of So uh, in, anti, in a two sublattice antiferromagnet, we have the right-handed mode, uh, the right-handed mode uh, and the left-handed mode. Uh, in each of the mode, uh, in the ground state, there is no magnetization, but when the system is driven into motion, then a small magnetic moment is developed. And in each of the chiral modes, um, the two sublattice spins have a different processing angles. So because of this non-collinearity, it is the exchange interaction of the two sublattice, between the two sublattices that drives the rotation. So now let's see uh, the dynamical mode of ferry magnet. In ferry magnet, we still have two chiral modes, uh, but the right-handed mode behaves ferromagnetically in which the two sublattice spins uh, keeps collinear, even when the system is in motion. Um, so the exchange interactions between the two sublattices 
does not drive this precession. It is the anisotropy and the Zeeman interaction with the external magnetic field that drives the motion. So in the right-handed mode, the behavior is just identical to a ferromagnet, as if the system is described by a magnetization vector alone. And understandably, this mode has a rather low frequency on the gigahertz, uh, on the gigahertz level. So what is in interesting is the left-handed left mode. In the left-handed mode, uh, the two sublattered spins clearly has uh, non-collinearity. And the magnetization associated with this mode has a pi phase difference um, from the larger spin. And because the two sublattices are non-collinear, so it is the exchange interactions that drives the left-handed mode. And because of that, this mode behave antiferromagnetically uh, in the terahertz region. And this mode is formally known as the exchange mode, or we can just uh, call it antiferromagnetic mode. So um, the take home message here is that for a two sublattice ferry magnet, it can either behave ferromagnetically or antiferromagnetically. So um, similar to an antiferromagnet, the two modes carry opposite dynamical angular momentum. So here, let me just ignore the minus sign in the gamma factor. Um, the non-equilibrium angular momentum associated with the ferromagnet mode is pointing downwards. Well, the non-equilibrium angular momentum carried by the high frequency exchange mode is pointing upwards. So the two modes indeed carry opposite angular momentum. And this, this property is just similar to an antiferromagnet. So in the following, let's see how the two modes can be excited selectively by spin transfer torques. And here, let me just consider damping-like torques only because a field-like torque would actually behave as a magnetic field and the behavior is just similar to what we had introduced in the previous section. So in this section, let me focus our attention to damping-like torques. So um, um, if we apply an external spin polarization, for example, arising from a spin Hall effect um, um, uh, that drives by the external circuits, if the spin polarization is uh, anti-parallel to the larger spin, but the parallel to the smaller spin, then we are injecting spin down angular momentum into the system, uh, which will excite the low frequency mode or the ferromagnetic mode. And the consequence is the following. So you clearly see this is a right-handed precession and this mode evolves with time until it becomes a spin switching. And uh, during the process of a spin switching, the two spins, uh, you know, uh, always keeps collinear. So the exchange interaction does not come into play. That's why the system behaves just as a ferromagnet. So this is a spin switching. We are injecting spin down into the system, which in, um, induces, uh, which excites the low frequency ferromagnetic mode with right-handed um, chirality. And the consequence is a spin switching. So now if we flip the orientation of the external spin polarization, say if we inject a spin up to the system, then you know, the, the spin polarization just matches the non-equilibrium dynamical spin angular momentum of the exchange mode. So this is supposed to excite the high frequency exchange mode with left-handed precession. And let's see what is gonna happen. So, well, the precession, you know, initially grows with the time until the magnitude reaches, you know, uh, uh, until the magnitude saturates and the system remains in a steady state oscillation. So if we fix the time in the precession, then we can see, uh, let me, 
So let's see a frame. Okay. So you'll see that the two spins are clearly non-collinear and the precession has, is counterclockwise if, you, uh, if we take a bird eye view from the top. So this is indeed the, the excitation of the left-handed mode or the exchange mode. So by the way, so if uh, we only have the red arrows or let's say if we only have a one sub lattice, uh, the ferromagnetic system, then applying the spin polarization along the spin, you know, uh, induces nothing. So nothing happens. You simply uh, stabilize the ground state. But if there are two different sub lattices, if the system is not a fer ferromagnet, but in fact a ferry magnet, then we can have completely different consequences uh, depending on the orientation of the spin polarization. So this steady state polarization with left-handed uh, left chirality, this is, this is a unique feature of Ferry magnet. Uh, and it is impossible in a ferromagnet, okay? So now let's see, okay. So now let's look into the steady state oscillation of the high frequency exchange mode driven by uh, a damping like torque. So here, um, let me uh, also introduce a hard axis on top of the easy axis. Um, and the spin polarization, like I said, is always applied along the easy axis direction parallel to the uh, larger spin in the ground state. And let me plot a phase diagram in terms of the DC spin pumping. Say uh, the, the DC pumped a spin current to an adjacent normal metal uh, with a spin polarization along the easy axis direction. So the phase diagram plots the DC spin pumping uh, with, a, with a continuously uh, varying ratio of the two sub lattices. So here, this is zero, and in this limit, this is one. So if the ratio becomes exactly one, this is the anti-ferromagnetic limit. And in anywhere between zero and one, we have a ferry magnet. So um, here, I plot the DC spin pumping as a function of the, um, the, 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 the damping-like spin torque scaled by by the exchange field and the ratio between the two sublattice sub spins. And we see three different phases. This is the static phase. So the system simply remains static. And this is a spin flip phase in which uh, the smaller spins is, uh, is dragged to the direction of the larger spin. So this is a total spin flip. Uh, where the two sub lattices are polarized in the same direction. And there's um, a third phase that corresponds to a steady state oscillation of, of this left-handed mode with a high frequency. And what is interesting here is that if we go to the anti-ferromagnetic limit, where S2 equals S1, then the threshold of generating an auto oscillation becomes very high. So by tuning, by tuning down the ratio of the two sub lattices, then we achieve an optimized uh, uh, nano oscillator with a highly reduced uh, threshold current density. Uh, and the actual location of this optimal uh, ratio uh, depends on the ratio of the hard axis and the easy axis anisotropy. So this is gonna be a materials property. So here I would like to compare, um, you know, the, the spin torque induced auto oscillation of a ferry magnet with that in a uh, anti-ferro magnet. So the reduced threshold is not the only advantage of using ferry magnet. We know that this phase, which uh, you know, generates a DC spin current as the output. So um, 
here we in the system we only include spin torque the exchange interaction and anisotropy but nothing else however in an antiferromagnet let's see uh, let's focus on this antiferromagnet limit um, so it only has two phases the system is either static or suddenly flops to a plane perpendicular to the applied spin uh, to the spin polarization and rotates continuously on that spin flop plane uh, in order to uh, stabilize a steady state oscillation between the a spin flop oscillation and static phase then actually a feedback mechanism is required and the feed, feedback mechanism um, which we have no time to introduce was specified in a previous publication this is a combined uh, effect of the spin hall effect and the inverse spin hall effect but in the antiferromagnet this feedback mechanism is actually required in order to have a controllable amplitude of steady state oscillation Comparatively, in a ferry magnet, the system can stabilize on its own. No feedback mechanism is ever uh, required. So the system can uh, exhibit a controllable amplitude of the left-handed left oscillation, and this oscillation can stabilize on its own. No feedback is required. So here the morale is by using a ferry magnet, instead of instead of antiferromagnet we can still achieve a high frequency uh, auto oscillation driven by spin torque but at the same time the auto oscillation can stabilize on its own with a reduced threshold so that is the great promise of ferry magnet so here we also uh, studied the case in which the spin polarization is applied along the hard axis uh, rather than the easy axis in this case uh, we again plot a phase diagram in terms of the dc spin pumping uh, parallel to the applied spin polarization and here's the phase diagram so now we see four different phases a static phase as usual and the spin flip phase in which the two sublattices are, um, are pointing in the same direction as the spin polarization. And there is a steady state oscillation with a left-handed chirality, but this time this is a precession around the hard axis because the spin polarization is applied along hard axis. What is, what is interesting is that we, all, we can also have an intermediate phase in this phase, there's no steady state oscillation, but uh, we have reorient, reoriented the sublattices uh, from the easy axis to the hard axis. So now we have a four different phases. This is static phase when, this, when the sublattice spins are parallel, uh, remains in the easy axis direction. And this is a spin reorientation by spin torque, a left handed high frequency spin uh, steady state oscillation and a spin flip phase so here's a brief sum summary of the dynamical behavior of ferry magnet uh, we compare it with ferromagnet and antiferromagnet in ferromagnet we only have a one sub lattice so if we apply a spin polarization uh, parallel to the ground state spin orientation then nothing happens you simply enhances you simply enhance the ground state and if the spin polarization is anti-parallel to the ground state then above a threshold you can induce a spin switching uh, we are uh, so this behavior is well established and in antiferromagnet we have two anti-parallel uh, sub lattices with equal magnitude so the system can be driven into either a left-handed or a right-handed uh, oscillation depending on the spin polarization uh, from external circuits and in ferry magnet it can behave either ferromagnetically or antiferromagnetically 
depending on the spin polarization from external circuits. So when the spin is uh, parallel to the small spin, it behaves ferromagnetically um, and exhibits spin switching. When the spin polarization is parallel to the larger spin, then it behaves anti-ferromagnetically and exhibits a steady state oscillation of the left-handed mode. But I'd like to remind you again that uh, in the anti-ferromagnetic behavior, uh, ferry magnet still has a finite magnetization which is uh, easier to control and detect. Uh, and at the same time, um, the auto oscillation of this high frequency mode can stabilize on its own with a reduced threshold. So that is uh, all what I want to talk about this work today. And finally, please let me make an advertisement. So in the forthcoming Triple M meeting, uh, which unfortunately is an online meeting due to the COVID. So there's a special session, um, um, uh, which is a tutorial session uh, targeted at uh, new graduate students in the field of spintronics and magnetism. And I will be presenting two lectures for the tutorial and more information can be found on this website. So this tutorial session was originally scheduled as IEEE Magnetic Summer School. Uh, um, you know, the original schedule was uh, a summer school uh, held in Taiwan uh, in July, but unfortunately it was canceled due to COVID. And so it has been rescheduled in the Triple M meeting and you are welcome to, uh, to check this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ren, for this interesting talk. So uh, we are now going to take questions. As usual, in Zoom, just uh, use the raise hand uh, button. Um, it's under the participants panel. If you can't find it, send me a private chat message. And if you are uh, watching on Twitch, just type in your question in the chat box, and I'm going to read it for you. So uh, the first question. Uh, in Zoom, um, Meng Zhang, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Ron. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so, uh, if we consider uh, the left hand mode in YIG, uh, what kind of uh, spin torque field we need in order to excite that mode? Say, you know, can we say, can we use uh, platinum and a typical charge current to excite that mode? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the question. This is actually a very good question. Um, so let me answer this question um, from two angles, uh, uh, from, you know, the two, yeah, two different angles. First of all, um, so EEG is very complicated. It has, you know, like uh, even 20 sub-lattices. So it remains an open question whether a two sub-lattice simplification can fully capture the dynamics of EEG. So that's question number one, which I have, an, you know, I have a not a um, definite answer, but let's assume that a two sub description is a good approximation for EEG. Then the second perspective is that, so right now we have been treating EEG as a ferromagnet. So for spin switching, for auto oscillations, we always apply a spin polarization anti-parallel to the magnetization, right? So the prediction here is that if you reverse the, um, you know, if you reverse the spin polarization from spin Hall effect, for example, uh, then above a very high threshold, we end it, uh, we, um, it is expected that we can observe a steady state oscillation with a left-handed chirality. Uh, but we have simply not tried that possibility. Right, because we have been treating, treated it as a ferromagnet. So we would naively think that if we apply the spin parallel to the ground state magnetization, we simply stabilize the ground state and nothing happens. But the prediction is that, well, this is not, not true. If you continue to increase your spin polarization or current density, then eventually you are able to see a left-handed auto oscillation. So that is the prediction for EIG. Okay, thank you, Ram. Yeah, thanks for the question. 
Thank you. Mark, next question, please. Uh, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that you're making the typical approximation that most of us always make, and that's to ignore the difference between the angular momentum and the magnetization. And frequently you can get away with that, but for some uh, ferry magnets, like say cobalt terbium, you get interesting transitions where the ratio between them on the different sublattices changes. So I was wondering if you'd thought at all about uh, when it might be more important to think about the moment and when it might be more important to think about the spin? Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, that is also a very excellent question. So yes, I, uh, uh, I fully agree that in, um, in ferry magnets, you know, the relations between spins and magnetic moments are rather complicated. Uh, and especially when you're considering the compensation temperature, this can even flip side. So, uh, so here, I mean, so let's say this, um, uh, at a fixed temperature, uh, if we do not vary the temperature, then there's a, uh, you know, fixed uh, sign between spins and magnetic moments. So then the gamma factor, the sign of the gamma factor, you know, uh, only affects and uh, only contributes to an overall uh, minus sign possibly. But if you consider a change in temperature, then you are actually change the ratios of the two spins. So that's why I always plot the, um, the phase diagram with this spin ratios as a varying parameter. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, around the compensation temperature, yes, when the, if the gamma factor can flip sign, um, then it seems that I should extend this ratio to the negative you know, to even to the negative uh, axis, a uh, negative uh, direction. So yeah, um, well, yes, that is that might be a good uh, a good direction to look into in the future. Um, but I mean, by allowing the ratio to to change, I think this already partially captured uh, what we could observe. You know, by changing the temperature. I'm not sure if this is a satisfactory answer to your question. I don't have anything, I don't have any particular insight. I was just, it strikes me that the field is coupling to the moment in the injected spin current, I'm guessing is coupled to the angular momentum. And so you might get be in a situation where it, you get one type of behavior if you're perturbing it with a field and another type of behavior when you're perturbing it with a spin. Uh, yes, yeah. so I, I think for the spin torque driven dynamics, it is the spin angular momentum that matters. Yes, um, but for field driven motion that couples directly to the magnetic moment. Uh, yeah, so, so, so here, uh, I mean, for, uh, for the second part of my talk, I, I focused on the spin angular momentum alone. Uh, but of course, uh, you can, you know, multiply the respective gamma factor to each of the spins and convert it into moment. Uh, but when simulating the dynamics, I consider the spin angular momentum alone. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, thank you. next question, please. Okay, uh, Ron, yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for the uh, talk. And I, I just have a question on the second slide uh, from the end, the second uh, last, yeah. Okay, this one? So, yeah. Uh, if I just look at, look at the, the anti-ferromagnetic case, right? So those are two lattice are exactly identical. Now, mm -hmm. whether injector spin is parallel to the S1 or parallel to the S2 seem to me is exactly identical. So from that end, I can imagine left-handed mode, it should be same as right-hand mode. But that's not true. So how do I reconcile this uh, thinking? Um, oh yeah, so, okay. So the left-handed and the right-handed chirality is defined when we specify a particular direction, for example, the positive uh, Z axis 
and you take a bird eye view from the top. So I, I mean, uh, so in the, okay, so let's say for the right-handed mode, this is a right-handed mode precession um, around the S1 direction. And this is a left-handed mode also with respect to the S1 direction. But if you look the opposite way, this becomes yeah, the right-handed mode. Yeah. I understand if you look a different way, you can get the left and the right, but they do have a different field dependence, right? Uh, yes, um, yes. So below the spin flop transition, one of the mode has, uh, is lowered in frequency by the, by, a, by the applied B field. The other one has a raised frequency uh, with respect to the B field because the B field selects out one of the modes with the matching spin polarization. Okay. The two modes carry opposite spin angular momentum. So one mode has a raised frequency, the other one has a lowered frequency. Okay, so at the zero field, field, those two modes should be exactly the same, it's just a look at, at the different direction. Right, in the absence okay. of B field, the two modes become the degenerate, and the degeneracy is guaranteed by symmetry. Yeah, okay. But that symmetry depends, also depends on the anisotropy. So uh, um, this conclusion is true for a uniaxial anisotropy. Let's say you only have an easy axis, but if you also have a hard axis, then you no longer have that asymmetry and you no longer have to degenerate uh, circularly polarized mode, but instead you have a two linearly polarized mode with a, you know, uh, with a uh, non-degenerate frequency. Yeah, okay, thanks. So let me read a question from Twitch because I think it's, uh, it's related to, to the previous questions um, or maybe even uh, covered already. So the question is the following, uh, are the two damping like torques applied simultaneously and with the same amplitude on each sublattice? Uh, and the only thing that's uh, changed is the magnetization amplitude of each sublattice and not the torques. So I guess it's a question about the, uh, the, the simulation that, that you perform. So if um, sure. you assume the two amplitudes are the same or not necessarily. Oh, okay. So in the simulation, which you know, I, I didn't write in detail. So I use like S1 dot equal to you know, all the terms from RLG and the plus S1. So I use like omega S, um, to represent the strength of the driving current scaled in the frequency dimension and over the S1 squared, so n times S1 cross small s, this applied spin accumulation cross S1. So, and for S2, uh, you just uh, change everything into S2. So this convention was, uh, you, know, you know, follows the uh, conservation of spin angular momentum. So basically I consider a G type uh, interface. So on the interface, we have, um, uh, we have an equal number of A sublattice and a B sublattice. Um, so the flux of spin angular momentum, uh, this flux of spin angular momentum on, through the two sublattices are the same. So within the same period of time, we are injecting equal um, amplitude of spin angular momentum to the two sublattices, but the, since the two sublattices have a two uh, have a different amplitude, so the reactions of the two sublattices can be very different. But here, uh, this term in the actual simulation, um, you know, uh, was written uh, in order to respect the spin angular momentum conservation. Yeah, so I think actually if you if you perform a first principles calculation on the ferry magnet, uh, you will get different amplitudes uh, for the torques just because um, there are different states in the Fermi level. And I mean, imagine you have D states in one case and maybe F states in the other, or they, they are distributed in energy in different ways. Um, you're not going to have a torque that is symmetric be, be, between the two sublattices. So maybe something to... Uh, uh, yeah, to so yeah. actually we had tried that possibility. So we gave it omega S1 and omega S2, and we mm -hmm. can also vary the two uh, the ratios between the two. Mm -hmm. um, 
So in that complicated simulation, which I didn't show in the slide, uh, we get a, you know, we get qualitatively the same phase diagram, but the phase boundaries becomes, you know, twisted. So, um, I mean, I, I, yes, I, I recognize that uh, uh, what you have just com uh, commented, the actual uh, spin transfers between the spin polarization and a specified sub-lattice spin can be different uh, in a ferry magnet. And that is also a tunable ratio, uh, which is a materials parameter. Um, but uh, what we have found so far is that we still have a very similar phase diagram, but the phase boundaries becomes, you know, the, the shape actually changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dong Wook, next question, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for a very nice talk, for a very intuitive exp explanation about the ferromagnetic dynamics. So my question is also about a bit more related to the previous questions. So uh, the general question is how can we measure uh, different dynamical modes in experiments? So mm -hmm. specifically, uh, if we use the same technique that is used for ferromagnets, like FMR or second harmonic, uh, how can we measure like the dynamics of the ferry magnet? Um, so I, I think um, one of the uh, most straightforward way to measure um, the excitation of the dynamical modes is uh, by measuring the DC spin pumping. So the, direct, the sign of the DC spin pumping directly reflects the chirality of the dynamical modes. I see, uh, but one thing that I am actually worried about is that, um, okay, uh, one simplification we can make is that we, we may assume that we measure some average of the two spins in different sub lattices, but actually the way the charge carrier couples to different sub lattices are sometimes different because of Magnetic moment may come from d orbital or the other may come from f orbitals. So if we assume these kind of uh, more realistic complications, do you expect uh, any extra effect that experimentalists may measure in their experiments? Um, I, I think, I mean, um, I'm not exactly sure if I, uh, you know, fully understand the question, but I mean, uh, like I just uh, res, uh, replied to the previous question, so the phase boundary can change its shape if yes. you, you know if the the, the spin is couples differently mm -hmm. on the two sub lattices. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, um, you know, the, the the qualitative structure of the phase diagram is still the same. You still have a, a three different phases. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, we had to try that. Uh, but I, I didn't show because that, that, that's too detailed and too too technical. I see. Um, but but I think I mean uh, by measuring the DC spin pumping, the sign is a direct reflection of the spin polarization. So, you know, um, so I think you can you are able to identify if this is indeed a left-handed precession or not. Mm -hmm. I see. And also, uh, and also, I I think uh, so 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 the first question. Uh, raised by Ming Zheng, I, I think that is, a, uh, that is also a good point. So, for example, in Ig or other familiar ferry magnet, so far we have been treated as a ferromagnet, magnet and we, we haven't tried this possibility because we simply thought there was going to be nothing happened. But in fact, if you can realize a really large current density, then possibly you can find, you know, suddenly there will be a spontaneous oscillation and which pumps a DC spin current to the external circuit. Uh, so that is also a way to identify the predicted behavior. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So if there are further questions, please, uh, again, raise your hand or, or type them in uh, in Twitch. Um, in the meantime, let me ask you um, another question. Um, so you showed that uh, there are two, di two qualitatively different um, 
types of behavior for the, for the antiferromagnet and theory magnet. In one case, you have left-handed and right-handed, and in, in, in the other case, you have one mode um, where the two spins precess in sync. Uh, but uh, let's consider a situation where uh, we have a theory magnet that is actually very close to an antiferromagnet. Mm -hmm. And you can tune the difference between the two sublattices. So for example, you can, you can apply the external field or you can take a magnetoelectric, for example, and apply um, an electric field, if it's an insulator. Mm -hmm. um, and then you create an imbalance between the two sublattices and there is a small um, baby magnetic component. So how would the crossover from an antiferromagnet to a theory magnet in terms of this behavior come about if you tune this imbalance parameter? Oh yeah, that's a, okay, so that's a good question. So let me try to understand, uh, answer this this way. So again, I, I show this slide. Um, let me use a pen. Okay, so let's suppose we start by looking into a uh, antiferromagnet and continuously change the ratio of the two sublattices. Okay, so um, in the antiferromagnetic limit, we have two degenerate modes, and you know the two modes are you know respect certain symmetry. And once we you know make this uh, this sublattice a little bit smaller. Uh, then this right-handed mode um, immediately lowers its frequency. And, you know, the, the degrees of this uh, non-collinearity also reduces. Oh, uh, no, I, I mean, uh, not that. Okay, so, so actually, right, because this is eigenmode, if S1 and S2 are not equal to each other, then let's say this mode, um, well, I think this there might be a discontinuous change. Then this mode, um, okay, so, okay, so in order to understand this is kind of a weird discontinuous uh, change, let me uh, make an, uh, another, you know, analogy. So for example, if we introduce a small, infinitesimal uh, hard axis perpendicular to the easy axis, then these two circularly polarized mode will no longer be eigenmodes. Then suddenly you have a two uh, linearly polarized mode as the eigenmode, even though you introduce only an infinitesimal hard axis uh, because you break the symmetry suddenly. And here, I think a similar abrupt change happens here. So when the two spins becomes uh, imbalanced, then the eigenmode suddenly uh, undergoes a qualitative change. Uh, this mode basically remains. Uh, for this mode, um, you know, uh, when you solve the eigenstate with a small angle approximation, then you will find that the, the smaller spins will be, uh, will be parallel to, uh, anti-parallel to the larger spins. But if that were the case, uh... Isn't it true that you would never observe antiferromagnetic modes in practice? Because as soon as you apply the magnetic field, which you need anyway to observe the resonance, you would break the symmetry. Um, so it seems like there should be some kind of threshold or, or I don't know, maybe the uh, anisotropy plays a role in stabilizing those modes somehow. Okay, I, I think the Zeeman field cannot break the symmetry I, that I just illustrated. The Zeeman field can shift the energy, of course. Um, but the anisotropy and the spin imbalance, the delta S and the K, let's say KZ. Yeah, but, but also if you apply the field, uh, you would induce some uh, changes in the magnetic moments themselves, especially if it's a metal, but... Uh, 
uh, you apply the field, there, there is some redistribution in the electronic structure. So the moments will change a bit. Um, it is my understanding that um, the development, the development of a small magnetization by the magnetic field, it's in the fi uh, I mean, under finite temperature, is through the excitation of the you know different spin wave modes, so that on average you have an equilibrium magnetization. But at a zero temperature, if the B field is applied along the easy axis, then below the spin flop transition, then the system does not react. No, that's only in the Heisenberg model. In, in an actual material, if you have something on the Fermi level, then you would induce a moment. There will be a finite longitudinal susceptibility. Uh, right, yes. So, right. so for metallic system, yes. If you imbalance the Fermi energy, then that's a complicated thing, yes. Yes, I, I agree that, I mean, my modeling only applies to the Heisenberg model. Yes, for metallic magnetic system, for example, if the storm, storm magnetism um, is the mechanism, then the behavior can be very different. Yeah, I, I'm a bit concerned about this uh, abrupt transition um, in zero field because it kind of suggests that we should never observe um, left and right-handed modes in an antiferromagnet unless it's it's an idealized uh, Heisenberg model kind of thing, um, which seems um, surprising. No. So maybe uh, uh, the, there are a few questions in chat that um, that come from Ankit Shukla, whose microphone is not working. So um, number one, um, what is the geometry of the simulation setup? Is it a spin hole or something else? So it's, I guess it's, it, it's about the um, spin torque simulation. So does it assume there is a uh, um, heavy metal layer that generates um, the spin current through a spin hole effect? Uh, in the simulation, I, you know, I didn't specify the mechanism of generating the spin torque. In the simulation, you know, I only, uh, you know, the computer only cares about the direction and the forms of the spin torque. Right, but the assumption is the, that it comes from an adjacent heavy metal? Yes. I suppose? Yes, for example, a heavy metal spin expeding a spin hall effect, but it could also be a topologi topological insulator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the only assumption is that um, this is the damping like torque. Right, so it, but it, it is a bilayer geometry. Yes, yeah, a bilayer geometry, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question, what should the setup be for an out of plane spin polarization? Uh, this one? Oh, yeah, um, right. So there are two ways uh, to realize in the, um, this geometry. Uh, one is, uh, you know, both the hard axis and the easy axis are in the film plane. And the other one is that, for example, in the recently, uh, in, you know, recently um, it has been realized that in uh, Tustin by Telluride, and in plane currents can generate a out of plane spin polarization, which leads to a <clears throat> damping like torque. In that case, if the hard axis is perpendicular to the film, then you can also realize this geometry. Mm -hmm. And the, okay, the third question is probably closely related. So would the result for a spin polarization along the y-axis be qualitatively similar to that in case of the out-of-plane spin polarization? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. So, right, if you apply the spin along the intermediate axis, I guess that could be similar to the behavior of this scenario. But the thing is, the, if the hard axis is very hard, you know, if the hard axis is really hard, 
then possibly, uh, you know, practically you will be not be able to generate any auto oscillation because there are also oscillation have to overcome the hard axis. Uh, but in this scenario, um, even though the threshold is still high, um, once the oscillation is about the hard axis, um, you know, um, within one period, the spins only competes with the easy axis. So it could be close to a, you know, a very smooth uh, oscillation. Okay, thank you. So, um, last call for questions. Anyone hasn't asked but wanted to? This is your chance. If not, let's uh, thank Ren Chang again for this interesting talk. <laughs>